Hi everyone, Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy and I will be covering musculoskeletal questions and concepts that you must know for the CCRN exam. I will time mark this video, so feel free to just scroll through at your own pace, but I do give extra information and explanations after every question to really reinforce the content. If you like and subscribe to my channel, the next labs that you send have a 70% less chance of being chemalized. Totally kidding, but I would greatly appreciate it and it would help me keep helping all of you guys. Now we don't have too much to cover in the musculoskeletal lecture as there's only going to be a few questions about it on the CCRN, but there are a few important topics that I wanted to cover. So here we go. Question number one. A trauma patient with multiple long bone fractures suddenly develops agitation, tachypnea, tachycardia, and mild hypoxemia. Her lungs are clear and a petechial rash is noted on her upper body. Which of the following is suspected? Is it A, acute respiratory distress syndrome, B, fat embolism, C, deep vein thrombosis, or D, COPD? And the answer here is B, fat embolism. So what are our symptoms telling us that we're dealing with here? A patient is developing agitation, tachypnea, tachycardia, and hypoxemia. So definitely we're looking at some kind of respiratory distress. But then there's also this petechial rash that's noted, and this patient had multiple long bone fractures. So when you see long bone fractures and a petechial rash together, it's kind of a giveaway that we're dealing with a fat embolism here. It really wouldn't be ARDS because ARDS patients have wet lungs, and the answer is not DVT because a DVT does not always result in a PE. If it did though, the PE would be due to a blood clot and then you wouldn't have that petechiae. Question number two. Which of the following is the priority treatment for a patient with necrotizing fasciitis? A. Surgical debridement of the necrotic tissue. B. Nutritional support. C. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Or D. Antibiotic ointment. The answer is... A. Surgical debridement of the necrotic tissue. So necrotizing fasciitis, what is it? It is a rapidly progressive inflammatory infection of the fascia, and the fascia is the connective tissue which basically holds all of the inner structures in place. So not only is there necrosis of the fascia, but there's also necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue as well. So it's not pretty, and it might be very serious and even progress to septic shock, multiple organ dysfunction, and amputations. And some signs and symptoms include intense pain over the involved skin and underlying muscle, redness that can turn dusky or have purplish discoloration, and necrosis. You can also see systemic signs of an infection, such as a fever and malaise. I don't have too much else to say about necrotizing fasciitis, but I do want to emphasize that the treatment for neck fasci is going to be early debridement of the necrotic tissue. Early debridement has been shown to decrease both morbidity and mortality in patients, which is always important. And while nutritional support and hyperbaric oxygen therapy might be helpful for neck fasci, they aren't the priority here compared to that surgical debridement. Question number three. Which of the following is not a negative outcome of immobility? A, increased resting heart rate, B, dementia, C, pain, or D, urinary retention? The answer is B, dementia. Dementia is a chronic problem that develops over time. 
This was here to trip you up because dementia is not something that will be caused by immobility, but delirium can certainly be caused by immobility. Question number four. Your patient has been on norepinephrine at five mics per minute for the last two days. The physician asks if you could sit the patient up in the chair. The best response is A. Certainly. I will use some of the safe patient handling equipment that we have. B. I cannot do that as the patient is on vasopressors. C. I cannot do that as the patient has not gotten up all week. Or D. I cannot do that as the patient is weak. The best response here is A. Certainly, I will use some of the safe patient handling equipment that we have. So when it comes to immobility, Immobility is a consequence of critical illness that we see quite often, and it has many negative effects on many of the body systems. Immobility can cause an increased heart rate, decreased vital capacity, atelectasis, pneumonia, muscle weakness, urinary retention, constipation, pain, pressure injuries, delirium, prolonged ventilator stays, ICU and hospital stays, and the list goes on. So you can see that there are so many negative consequences of immobility. And as nurses, we want to contribute to our patients' recoveries and their positive outcomes, so we must participate in progressive mobility. And evidence shows that nurse-driven protocols for progression of patient mobility are effective in improving outcomes. We absolutely want to understand and utilize safe patient handling equipment. We want to make sure that we've given adequate pain control so that your patients can move comfortably. And as always, we want to make sure that these patients are maintaining hemodynamic stability. Lastly, we want to utilize physical therapy when needed for more complex mobility challenges. But just because you're taking care of an ICU patient doesn't mean that you have to wait for physical therapy. You can absolutely get your patient up if they don't meet any contraindications. Some of these contraindications include myocardial instability, such as chest pain, ischemia, or new arrhythmias. If they're having respiratory or oxygenation issues, believe it or not, you can mobilize patients on ventilators as long as they aren't in respiratory distress or have high FiO2 or PEEP requirements. If patients are on vasopressors, which have increased in dose in the last two hours, or if they have two or more vasopressors infusing, that would be a contraindication. But if a patient is on one presser, just like our last question posed, holding steady with no other hemodynamic compromise, you can actually mobilize them. Question number five. A patient is two days status post ORIF of a left tib fib fracture following a fall on a construction site. The patient is now complaining of severe left leg pain. The leg is very taut and firm, but pulses are present. The priority intervention for this patient is to A. Provide morphine for the pain. B. Contact the surgeon. C. Continue to monitor the pedal pulses. D. Elevate the left leg. And the answer here is B. You want to contact the surgeon. So this patient has signs and symptoms of compartment syndrome, and they should be examined by a surgeon since the patient may need his compartment pressure to be measured. He may also need an emergent decompressive fasciotomy depending on what's going on. So you definitely want that surgeon to come and evaluate the patient. The pain does need to be addressed, but only after the surgeon is notified. And then the pedal pulses need to be monitored, but a loss of pulses is actually a later sign of compartment syndrome. And again, your priority is notifying the surgeon. Lastly, the left leg should not be elevated because that will actually decrease arterial blood flow to that tissue. 
Question number six. A patient is admitted with rhabdomyolysis. Serum creatine kinase is 10,000 units per liter. Which should the nurse anticipate? A. Addition of sodium bicarbonate to infusing fluids. B. Maintenance of urinary output at 0.5 to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. C. Performance of a 12-lead EKG. Or D. Initiation of 0.9 sodium chloride at 10 milliliters per hour. The answer here is A. Addition of sodium bicarbonate to infusing fluids. So we want to add sodium bicarbonate to fluids to alkalinize the urine, which is going to help the kidneys. And we want to treat rhabdo with aggressive fluid replacement. We want to usually aim for at least 2 to 3 milliliters per kilogram per hour. That can sometimes be up to 500 milliliters of normal saline per hour. So it's definitely not going to be anything close to 10 milliliters per hour, like choice D says. And for C, performing a 12-lead EKG is just not something that's indicated at this time. Question number seven. A patient sustained a crush injury at a construction site. The patient's urine is tea-colored and the urine output is 20 milliliters per hour. The creatine kinase, or CK, is 15,000 units per liter. The nurse knows that this patient is at risk for which of the following? A. Heart failure. B. Hyperkalemia. C. Alkalosis. Or D. Acute liver failure. The answer is B hyperkalemia. This patient has signs and symptoms of rhabdomyolysis based on their CK level being more than 10,000. They have tea-colored urine and low urine output. And in rhabdomyolysis, there is massive muscle breakdown and massive destruction of skeletal muscle cells. And when these cells break down, they release creatine kinase, otherwise known as CK, as well as potassium. So you are going to have hyperkalemia. Question number eight. A nurse is caring for a patient with rhabdomyolysis secondary to a crush injury. Which of the following orders should the nurse question? A. Administer mannitol. B. Monitor the serum potassium level. C. Test the patient's urine for myoglobin. Or D. Infuse 0.45 normal saline at 100 milliliters per hour. The answer is D. Infuse 0.45 normal saline at 100 milliliters per hour is something you do not want to do when you have a patient with rhabdomyolysis. So a patient in rhabdo requires large amounts of isotonic solution. That will be your 0.9 normal saline. 0.45 is a hypotonic solution, and it won't adequately flush those renal tubules like we want. Instead, it's going to leave the vascular space and it's going to move into the cells and we do not want that. We do want to administer mannitol, we do want to monitor the patient's potassium level, and we do want to test the urine for myoglobin. So we talked about this in the last three questions that we just went over, but let's just do a quick recap. So in rhabdomyolysis, there is massive muscle breakdown and massive destruction of skeletal muscle cells. And this massive destruction releases myoglobin, creatine kinase, or CK, into the blood. It also releases potassium into the extracellular and intravascular spaces. And the release of the myoglobin can clog the renal tubules, also known as myoglobinuria. And that clogging of the renal tubules may lead to acute kidney injury. 
The causes of rhabdo include trauma, crush injuries, prolonged immobility such as with falling and staying on the ground for hours or days, and drug overdoses. And patients with rhabdomyolysis will have symptoms like dark tea-colored urine with low urine output. They can have muscle pain and muscle weakness. As far as labs go, there will be large amounts of myoglobin in the urine. There will be increased levels of creatine kinase, greater than 10,000 units per liter, and they will be at risk for hyperkalemia. So how do we treat rhabdomyolysis? If you remember back to our answers in the last few questions, we are going to administer large amounts of isotonic fluid in order to flush those kidneys out to prevent permanent renal tubule damage. We want to administer isotonic fluids to maintain urine output of greater than 300 milliliters per hour or about two to three milliliters per kilogram per hour. We also want to alkalinize the urine by adding sodium bicarb into the IV fluids. Again, this is to help flush and buffer those renal tubules to help protect the kidneys. We can give mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, and it helps decrease swelling in those injured muscle cells. And lastly, we want to monitor for and treat hyperkalemia. Question number nine. A patient is admitted with long bone fracture of the forearm. The patient reports severe pain and numbness to the extremity. Compartment syndrome is 35 millimeters of mercury and blood pressure is 100 over 55. Which intervention should the nurse anticipate? A. Administration of medication to increase systolic blood pressure. B. Elevation of the arm on a pillow. C. Placement of a warm soak to the painful area. Or D. Prepare patient for fasciotomy. The answer here is D. You want to be preparing that patient for a fasciotomy. So a fasciotomy is recommended when compartment pressures exceed 30 millimeters of mercury. And this patient also has other symptoms such as severe pain and numbness to the extremity that will notify us that this is probably compartment syndrome as well. Compartment syndrome is the development of elevated pressure within the muscle fascia, and this may lead to decreased blood flow, which results in damage to muscle tissue and the nerves. Causes of compartment syndrome can be due to crush injuries, surgery, or fractures. Some clinical signs include severe pain, more than would be expected of the injury, numbness, loss of movement, and a late but not always reliable sign could be loss of pulses. But remember, it's a late sign, and at that point, permanent damage can already have been done. In regard to treatment, we want to measure intracompartmental pressure as soon as possible. A compartment pressure of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury is considered compartment syndrome. And if that's the case, an emergent decompressive fasciotomy is indicated to prevent permanent nerve and or vascular injuries. You definitely want to maintain the affected limb at the level of the heart and not above because we don't want decreased blood flow to those tissues. Lastly, pain control will be important for these patients. Like I said, this one's going to be a quick one, so we have already made it to the end. If you liked the video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate that. If you're taking the CCRN soon, good luck to you. You can absolutely do this. I've gotten comments from people telling me that they have passed their CCRN, and I am so happy for all of you guys. I know that you can do this. Thanks everybody for watching. Nurse Jenny signing off for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.